Welcome. And let's get into party versus time for our first two maps of the day in player one versus newbie China team championship season one week two day two top left hand side our blue Protoss player is parting representing player one you uh well I mean both these teams actually getting off to pretty rough starts in the first week with player one falling down to TSG last week Parting was the only player to pick up maps on his team as he took down Cloudy, Firefly and Fantasy Fall to Solar and Hero respectively. So player one looking for their first win. So are Newbie, who went 1-5 last week with Deer dropping 0-2 to Sakura. Ragnarok uh, taking a drop in the map to Scott was the only map that Newbie won. And then time got 0 2 would by Gumiho. And this is time once again the Red Terran player to try and come out and to get something done here at the start of today's matches. Now, today's matches are pretty fun actually in this series. We've got Time versus Parting, then we've got Scarlet versus Firefly, and Dear Fantasy is going to wrap it up. So, a lot of potential, I think. A lot of uh, cool different possibilities, I would say, in terms of how this could turn out. And uh, I really feel like Time can definitely pull off a win against Parting, for example, to get into a bit of a cheeky lead and you know, to really mess this series up. And it could really, well, come down to that Dear Fantasy series as well, as it did last week for... Uh, player 1, it came down to Fantasy Hero and it did not go to the ace match despite a very close game 6. Fantasy lost uh, lost his advantage there and just didn't quite manage to close it out. So yeah, um, very exciting times, very exciting stuff as we do see the first Reaper of time is going to start heading out towards the upper left hand side of the map. Going to have a little bit of a look to see what's going on here in these early stages. Now I just need to double check that I am attached to the Team Liquid page, which I'm not. So let's fix that. Also, why the match is not listed, I don't know. So let's fix that as well. God damn it. You know, you don't do the Team Liquid event one time, and the next thing you know, everyone's just messing you up. Messing you up. Let's Firefly, there we go. Scarlet, put in the time. Fantasy, dear. And then we have Maru taking on Patience and Jinnah Greenwings versus the world later. It's going to be a lot of fun as well. And also Rogue's going to be playing, so that should be pretty cool. And uh, Impact's going to be playing against Rex. Perfect. Alright, well as we see this first Reaper out, there has been a second Barracks added on here pretty early. So, actually that early second Rax creates a bit of an interesting dynamic here with a lot of early game Reapers. Now a Hellion coming up as well. Obviously kind of keeping these units at home, looks like time wants to hide them and then come across the map all of a sudden and be like, boom! Look at me, I've got a bunch of units and just sort of run in and catch parting completely off guard, which he might. There's only, what, two Stalkers out? Okay, three Stalkers out. But if you kill one Stalker right away with five Reapers, it's, too, it's totally possible. Six Reapers in a moment, by the way, as well. Hell, you need to back it up. Two Stalkers at the front. Now the Observer's going to see this, so parting should be able to start microing, but the unit's already getting straight in here. Ah, the shield battery in the back's going to be huge. Goes for the other Stalker now instead, and we'll start to push up the ramp. This Stalker is definitely not in range of a shield battery. But again, Parton, oh my god, there's a shield battery in the main. Well, okay, Parton's just defended extremely well here. Gotta give credit where it's due. With no scout and information at all, he's got a shield battery in each mineral line. And time does absolutely nothing. That's actually crazy, because I really look at this, and I really think like time is meant to run up here and get so many kills. I mean, I feel like he should at least get the two free Stalkers, maybe, but... Obviously, then you start getting probes, but... Yeah, not the case. I feel like when you see the shield battery, maybe it's better to go to the probes. Because the Reapers should be able to one-shot probes, or at least shoot them down for whole damage, and the shield battery can't just keep them alive forever. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not sure not sure what the right call would be there, actually. But then if you die for the probes, of course, you're very committed with the Reapers, so you lose them. Whereas right now, at least the Reapers are alive, so you can still get something out of them. You're kind of keeping the probes player at home a bit. The question is, how long does that really happen for? Because... At the end of the day here, Parton is going to get Blink eventually. And, you know, if he'd opened Blink already, he'd have Blink and these Reapers would not be on the map anymore. So, it's only the fact it's a Robo-based opening that is keeping Time's Reapers on the map for the moment. A couple of Reapers going down. That's actually really nice as Parton does find a few kills. Time making a bit of a slip up there. Definitely not how he was expecting things to go or not how he wanted things to go. Don't know what he was expecting. Just needs to pay a bit more attention to those Reapers if he wants to keep them alive. That pylon is in the right place. It looks really weird in terms of how it was stacking up with that Nexus. It 
Very interesting. Well, Blink on the way, that bird next is dropping down a command center into the main base. And the Siege Shank building up as well. Stimpak is about to be done here on this barracks. And overall, I mean, everything looking pretty good here for time. And as we do just see a couple of refineries dropping down on this natural expansion as well. So getting that set up and ready to go. This parting sends an observer down to the bottom right hand side of the map. Again, to have a look to see what's going to be going on here in the next little while. There's a couple of Reapers still just hanging out to the left. Colossus about halfway done here, still being chrono boosted out. Blink about halfway done as well. So just building up into that Blink Colossus style it gives you a lot of power here in the King's Cove. And on a map where very, you know, usually you're just going to be able to sit back on three bases and get set up very easily, push into a fourth base nice and easily too, and your Blink Sword Colossus just keep you safe while doing all of that. It's a great way, great way to get established in the game, so. Farton just playing towards that now, starting to build into upgrades as well. He will be a bit behind the 1-1 upgrades of time here. And in fact, he only has a single forge, so actually time's upgrades are going to be very far ahead as the course of the game continues. As you see the plus one attack coming in from parting, the forge spinning away there. We're going to be seeing a couple probes coming over towards the upper right-hand side. And just seeing this observer coming down to the bottom as well. Also just trying to see what's up and what's going on. Extended thermal lunch just over halfway done. Another scan dropping down into the main base. Here's some extra gateways going to build up as well. So all of these getting set up in the main and the Colossus about to pop. And again, another couple of pylons coming through too, but here we go. I mean, Parlin is pushing across the map. Whether this is, you know, intending to kill time or anything, no, of course it isn't, but nice for him to be able to get across here and to apply a bit of pressure and maybe threaten the idea of attacking him. Forces time to make sure he's, you know, well defended, make sure he's set up properly. Tank sieging. A little late to see Judge. It's a shame they weren't in position, otherwise those stalkers would be D-E-A-D. -D. And again, I guess Parting knew that because of the observer up here. So knowing about that, as we see the first has to be taken down at the front, supply deep for taking some damage as well. He's trying to push up this ramp. A couple of uh, supply deep still taking some damage at the moment. Tank's gonna relocate back over to the right hand side. Cyclone getting picked off by a couple of force fields, so a couple of force fields going down and again just going to be seeing this army still pressing the rocks and time making and taking a couple of losses so far. Now he does have one one upgrades here, so he will have an upgrade advantage, but there's no way he can force a fight because he has to fight down a ramp into force fields. Colossus fire, there's just no way it's going to work out. It's a gravitic drive even on the way up, so part investing into that warp prism speed. And while he takes control of the map, he takes a fourth base up on the top side as well. Putting himself in a really good position here as a couple more SCVs will fall. A few more Zealots going to be warped in as well for parting. Colossus hangs out over on the right into the center. So you've seen plus one attack finishing up, plus one armor now on the way as well. Here we go, Zealot Stalkers, Sentries and Immortals pushing up this ramp. All of a sudden Parton just goes for the fight. I mean, there's quite a lot of siege tanks here, but a lot of them were positioned over to the left. And so time doesn't get that damage done as Parton initially runs up. And now Parton's already killed off 10 workers or so, forced to lift up on the natural. And it feels like he's still feeling comfortable to just sort of sit here and to maybe kind of stay in the natural. I mean, there's another siege tank here now. Looks like that is Parton's sign to get out of there. Warping in more units back at home. We're not actually sure what happened to our war prison. The prison did go down at some point, so we got shut down. So that's a nice little something for time. But at the end of the day, there's still these units that are here right now. And Time is just not cleaning them up at all again. Three siege tanks just not in range to join the fight. Try and chase down a Colossus, but the units will block. And while well, the Colossus gets out alive with 22 SCVs dropping down, Pine making a very effective shutdown happening. Game number one here essentially is we're going to be seeing that orbital landing down on the natural as well. And this army of Pine just being flung left and right a little bit. You'll see these few bio units run back over to the left. And again, just Stalkers, Colossus. Gathering up out the front. A few zealots going to join in here now as well. And we see two liberators are going to be setting up. And here he goes. Zealots, stalkers, and go off the start and press forward. First liberator goes down. And I think this is starting to go exactly as we expected to. Time is once again positioned on the left. He just doesn't have to. Alright, so to the bottom right hand side, our Red Prolus player, who's taking the first game of the day. This is going to be part of Top left hand side, our blue Terran player is time.
So, game number two. What does time have to fix, really? I mean, it, I mean, to be fair, the start obviously wasn't great. He delayed his expansion and invested a lot into T-Rex Reaper, which did nothing. So that didn't help him at all. It's a lot of gas invested, so he didn't have any pressure to apply. So straight up, already, Parton's in a very good position where he hasn't been delayed, he hasn't been slowed down, and the Terran has been. So typically, the Terran army is going to be in a pretty bad spot anyways. Now, obviously... You know, you can look at that and say, well, you know, he just needs to fix his build, which is kind of true. Like, I mean, if that you open like that and you don't do anything, you know, the build is a big part of the problem. But also, it's it's more than just that. There is also the fact that... Um, th it's also the fact that... Um, what was I going to say? There's also just the fact that he was just out of position, right? Like, the tanks were never in the right place. He just had no map control to see which ramp Parton was going to push up. Time and time again, he was sat on the third base, and Parton's just like, okay, well, I'm just going to push up the natural because I have an observer overhead, and I see exactly where you're positioned, and you're really favoring that left-hand side. So if I push up the right, you're going to be out of position. The Reaper is coming down to the bottom right hand side. Time. Looking to set up here as we see a factory on the way up. Second refinery being dropped down as well. Stalker being chrono boosted out at the moment, so getting this set up and ready to go. Just getting some early presences. There is already an adept moving across, so there will be a bit of a delay on this command center here. Marine is here to try and fight against this. A couple more SCVs already being pulled down, so actually quite a serious. Commitment to defending as the second Marine shows up. It's quite a lot of damage on that Adept. Now the Reaper comes up as well, and the Reaper, of course, outranges an Adept and should be able to chase this down. In fact, will chase this down to a kill. So a good defense this time around from time. Stalker will get to the high ground, though. And we'll have some kiting ability, but the command center is finished. And we'll be able to now morph into an orbital. Stalker poking away at the command center there as we do see that probe from parting. Pulling down to the bottom left hand side and it's just going to be setting itself up for something a little bit sneaky here. Whether it's just a scout or whether it may be something like a pylon coming down, we're going to find out shortly. Just going to see that Dark Shrine is on the way up. Twilight Council. And that's another gateway building up as well. Continues to run up this right hand side and Again, just waiting for this Dark Shrine as part. Definitely being a little bit cheeky here in game number two. And that's why there's probes on the left side, right? It's for that pylon. It's for that fast warping of DTs on the right side of the map, basically. So, uh, you know, when I say on the, it's obviously on the left side, but when I say the right side, I mean the correct side to be able to just get into the base of the Terran very quickly. You have to be a little bit careful with this proxy because you don't want to be found, because if it gets found, your opponent's immediately going to be like, well, what if you're doing with this? So if it's a bit too close, and it gets found, it's very bad for you, so Parton Golden is a fairly safe distance away. Cyclone going to be able to pick up this set of rocks, so, I mean, really nothing special. And as we do see, Time just going to be able to siege that tank up. Dark Shrine about to finish here as the Warp Prism Chrono boosting out from Parting. It's going to be heading across the map very shortly as we do see a single Marine of Time coming around the right-hand side. More DT is walking in here. Is that Warp Prism still on the way out? Okay, the Stalker's pulling back over to the natural expansion. Two DTs then try and deal some damage now. Here's the issue. No engineering bay, no missile turrets. No scans saved. These DTs are going to cause some chaos. They're just going to go for the army. Oh, I actually kind of love it. And especially when there's no scans available. I mean, look at this. So many Marines going down. These tanks are in there. There's a scan. To do what? I mean, oh my god, he's going to morph in an Archon and recall it, and it's actually going to get out alive. Wow, what a play by parting. Two tanks, multiple Marines. Eight Marines, two tanks. I, I mean, that's just great damage. I think as well, Time was paying attention to the front, so he wasn't going to be able to get up the ramp. I think that's probably the best thing he could have gone for, especially the tanks really resets any sort of aggression the Terran player might have been hoping for. Time, by the way, is still dropping mules. I guess he's got a third CC on the way in. 
So that's something at least for time. He doesn't lose any workers and he is on three bases, so he is able to get a strong economy up. He just does losing those two tanks and really throw off his build and throw off his, uh, you know, composition. Because now he's going to have less defenses, now he's going to have less pushing power. It's, uh, it's pretty tough, man. Pretty tough little position here. Finally, Simpak will start. And he used this arc on to start pushing forwards. I mean, this is the thing. He's killed off all of those units, so he knows there's not a lot here. He will lose the arc on to kill a siege tank. Now, that's kind of expensive. More Prism showed up a little bit late. I wonder if it was worth pushing in to kill that tank. Blink is about to be done. Even if he can just blink up to the main base, right? I mean, that's kind of scary in itself. Maybe he'll be able to kill a Raven right away there. Jumps in, kills the Cyclone, gets rid of the Raven pretty quickly. I mean, it's cost him a couple of store for sure, but... I mean, there's a lot of value in what he's just killed. There's 200 gas in the Raven, and he's getting some Marine kills now. The Warp Pistons will continue to micro these Stalkers around for a while. He even will in a couple more units. He does blink some of those Stalkers back as well. It's actually DTs that have been brought into play, and immediately he's going to get rid of the Combat Shield upgrade, and the Stimpak upgrade is going to be soon to follow. And those two tech labs extremely exposed in this position. But his DTs, I mean, where's the scan? Finally, the scan comes through. Stalkers have already blinked on top of the Siege Tank, though. Wolf is not quite in position to do much micro in here. I mean, the Marines are going to be able to fight these Stalkers off. There's more Stalkers warping in. I mean, the whole point of this is the factory off the position from the Siege uh, Tech Lab now. Snowball Siege Tanks. The whole idea of this right now from Barton is just to get enough done to just keep on slowing his opponent down and to keep on fighting. And he doesn't mind if he loses these Stalkers because he's killing so much of the army of his opponent anyways. And Wolf is and in two more Stalkers. We'll have to sit back for a moment as it is low on health. But 18 workers killed, Parting takes a 20 worker lead, a lot of Stalkers in play, back at home he's got plus one, he's got charge coming through, he's got a ton of gateways to work with, and he is ready to blink straight back into the main base, there goes the reactor build on the starboard, there goes the tech lab, researching Stimpak, and these Stalkers are going to have a blink ready to blink down to the low ground as they get low, and so nothing should really be lost here, just more SCV kills, and that's what, 10 more kills, maybe a couple more towards the end here, some Marines getting shaved off as well. Time can just not hold on to this, and Parting's pressure has been, well, extremely well executed as he flings back up into the main yet again. How many times is Stimpak going to die in a single game? That's the third denial of Stimpak. I mean, yes, it was barely started, but even still, just so frustrating for Time. He's just trying to get his bio upgrades up. He just wants to play a game of TBB. But the support team stalkers will not let him, as you still see high ground vision here of the Observer. There's enough units to blink on top, apparently, says Parting. Well, not going to be super clean, and he is going to lose a little bit. It is not, uh, it's not it's not right? I mean, he is still able to win out this fight, but no stalkers to warp in anymore because he doesn't have the warp prism. But Woodermine is going to come into this corner. He blinks forwards. He's going to come in towards those Woodermines. Time is really just trying to hold on to his very last dying breath at the moment. There's 31 more workers to kill. He's down below 20 SCVs. Half of those are still off the line chasing around stalkers. More stalkers just run across the map here. He's going to be able to just finally focus some attention to the natural. He's just been in the main base for an eternity now. He's going to be seeing the bunker gets killed off. The CC will be in trouble, and of course, time is quite literally ticking because there's nothing for the time to save this game for. It's just trying to fight it out. It will not work in part, and we'll pick up the first two maps of the day. Top left hand side, we open with our blue Zerg player. This is Scarlet representing Newbie. And at the bottom right hand side, our Red Protoss player is Firefly, representing player one, who have picked up the first series of the day in the form of parting taking down. The first series, the first two maps of the day in the form of parting taking down time. So how's everyone doing? Welcome to the stream. Good to see you all. Again, don't forget to drop that follow on the channel. If you want to keep up with all the China Team Championship action, there'll be more China Team Championship on Saturday and on Sunday as well. Uh, week three, so and then actually from here on out, we're also always going to have that China Team Championship action on Saturdays and Sundays. And he's going to be seeing the third hatchery dropping down here. Now the game's EVP setup. It's going to be a little bit different than usual because there's two gates and so there's two adepts already coming across the map. Scarlet sees this now with this Overlord. It's going to be a little tough for her to be able to deal with this because, well, she doesn't have any Zerglings yet, so she's going to have to make sure her queens are in really good positions. And look at this, the shield battery and another gateway dropping down. Another gateway dropping down, shield battery still on the way up as the two adepts coming over. And 
Jeff's just going to be shading through again. Already a spine crawler placed in the natural expansion. And we are just going to see the adepts coming up here. And it's the main base, so I mean, spine crawler obviously is not going to help much here. In, well, in fact, not much to help here in terms of anything. We're going to be seeing another Zergling going down, a couple of Zerglings going down. Adepts now back down to the low ground. This is obviously going to get pretty serious pretty quick as Scarlet now kind of knowing what's going on. That's why she's investing into that spine crawler, realizing the seriousness of this. And more depth showing up. The problem is, I mean, what defense is there up in the main? Well, not much, and that's why you have to keep bringing those lings back up there, which becomes a very frustrating experience. Maybe a kill on the spine crawler too. No cancel there. Scarlet losing the hundred minerals that maybe she could have saved some of. We see more shield batteries on the way up. Zergling's coming through. Queen's trying to fight against those adepts, and we are just going to be seeing them pushed away up to the top side. Stalk has never a death walking in here. Ten lings and Leafy coming through. Queen's the spine crawler coming forwards. It's going to be seeing the uh, shield batteries, though, obviously going to make it very difficult to fight against. Lings are wanting this around there, a few seconds away from speed. It's going to be a big turning point, of course, the shield batteries. Stumbling up these uh, depths at the moment. Another spine crawler dropping down. Queen backs away for Transfuse on it. Here come the Lings. I mean, this might be a depth become very useful because the depths are very good against the Zergans, but the Scorpions will not do as well. The depths are going to frame a shade forwards, but I'm not sure if that's going to work out. In fact, I'm not sure if Scarlet's going to be able to do much about this at all as we're going to be seeing first spine crawlers drop down. And now there's not really that many Zergans left. There's still shield batteries finishing, which means fresh amounts of energy. A couple more shield batteries dropping down here. I and mean, that's a dead overload. And Scarlet's actually very close to being supply blocked. Surprised that uh, Firefly hasn't been going for that spine crawl a little bit more, you know, committedly because really could have probably killed that there rather than chasing that queen. He's going to come in and try and go for it now. Have to be very careful not to go too far forwards. You do not want to be out of range of your shield batteries when you get surrounded by those Zerglings. This Crypt Team is actually a real annoyance because of that. It gives Scar that extra space where shield batteries cannot build. And that's actually a pretty big deal in all of this right now is that spine crawler uh, getting rid of the queen. I guess getting rid of the Queen is nice because if you get rid of the Queen, you get rid of potential transfusions as well as injects. I think Scarlet's in some trouble. Just going to see the Adepts again chasing down the drones. My Lings here. Obviously, Firefly back at home is just one base, so really is hoping to get a lot done with this. This is the sort of fight you're looking for. Scarlet fighting out of range of those shield batteries. The Adepts are going to commit to the shade, just moving over, over to the side. The thing is, now that you've uh, killed off the Spine and a couple of Queens, you don't need the Stalkers as much as you need the Adepts. The Adepts are really going to be the better part of this. And this one creep team is actually such a savior. It is really just stopping Firefly from sitting here and fighting because those shield batteries would be built like up to here or so. Instead, Firefly has to be very cautious about it as Adepts will threaten shape to the high ground. Now Scott's going into a Bane Nest though, and maybe she makes something happen, but actually her mineral line on the high ground's in trouble. That's already seven workers dead, and the Adepts are obviously in a very good position to just sit here and trade against Lings because they're all tucked up together. There is no surface area to surround. The Lings do nothing, and the Adepts will just shade out to the low ground, having brought Scarlet down to eight workers remaining. This Adept count continues to build with Firefly, looking as though they might be able to pick up a game here for player one, take it to a 3-0 scoreline already. And newbie might be in some trouble. We are just going to be seeing a couple of other adepts coming across. I mean, obviously still just warping in from this pile on gateway on the low ground. Being funny because it's three gates here in total with two gates built at home initially. This hatchery is going to go down as the adepts will shade up into the main base mineral line again. Well, this time, Firefly has to stay moving around against the Banelings. But Scarlet won't even try it. She knows she has no workers left. Even if she connects with those Banelings, those adepts, I mean, to the top left-hand side of the map. His team leading 3-0. We've got our Red Protoss player, Firefly. And as we have got to the bottom right, our blue Zerg player from Newbie. This is Scarlet. Scarlet obviously coming up against a very aggressive build in game one. Firefly bringing out the cheese to uh, kick this one off. We saw Firefly last week as well against Sola. Didn't really have much luck. I can't remember what Firefly tried to do against Solar even actually. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really know what. Uh, I can't. Can't quite remember. I kept the feeling it wasn't a very impressive series. Um, or a couple of games. I'm trying to think, but it was, I think it was pretty one-sided in favor of Solar. I was having a pretty shitty time this time last week, so I can't. Uh, 
quite remember it all. But yeah, these Chinese Brodos players, they definitely uh, like to bring the cheese with them because, I mean, we've seen the, uh, well, we've seen a bunch of um, intriguing uh, choices in terms of builds from these uh, Chinese Brodoses over the first couple of weeks already. Definitely uh, being rather aggressive in their choice of build orders. Probe coming through into the main base. Nexus drops down in the natural. Just another side of Nexus dropping down here as well. So again, that side of the core up and running. Natural coming down on the natural. Probe goes over to the right hand side. It is going to be uh, getting ready to drop down. I guess, I, mean, I don't know actually. I don't know why it's coming to the right side. It looks like he wants to take a third Nexus, but why on earth would you take a third Nexus? That's uh, two minutes in the game. Oh, a pylon over here. Unless Firefly's just going to completely change the meta of uh, PvZ. The fastest third Nexus you've ever seen. I think he just wants to hide his tech choice over to this side. Which makes a lot more sense and is the right sort of timing to hide your tech choice. What's it going to be though? Probably something like a Twilight or a Robo. Something that you don't really want to be seen scouted, I guess. Whereas a Stargate, you're not that bothered about. Speed on the way up. Do you see that Twilight Council again? Just about halfway done for the moment. Overlord from Scarlet coming up to the main base here as that probe continue to Chrono Boost out. So, continue to set up into this Adept. Also, about halfway done at the moment. That Wolf Gate still taking along here. Link speed. So, just about halfway done for the moment. Listening Glaives will. Uh, Start up here in the Twilight Council, so that's why Firefly doesn't want this scouted. The thing is, when Scarlet scouts it and sees no tech at all, she has to be wondering, well, did I miss out the front? She only has one overlord, so she has no way to reconfirm what's going on, like, over here. So that's probably, I think that would be, like, the go-to assumption. Oh my god, is this overlord going to start flying towards it? I gotta say that there's nothing to really, uh, stop the overlord. Oh, it changes direction. Oh, oh my god, that gateway builds. I think the gateway is going to give this away. Uh, that's a real shame from Firefly as well because, I mean, I'm just not sure what, what exactly the goal is of hiding the gateway there. I guess because she's expecting the Overlord, she's expecting the Overlord, so he's expecting the Overlord to come back in. And now Scarlet sees it. Retron is already on the way up, so that's not a response. That's just a, I kind of know what's going on here. Ah, that that game it really gave Firefly away a little bit. I'm actually a little bit sad about that because. I feel as though, you know you know the Overlord's over here, I guess you don't know there's no second Overlord, right? So you're still a little bit, uh... And... Mm. Um, so tough as you do see the hallucinated Phoenix going to come across the map. A few Zerglings here from Scarlet, coming out into the center. At this point, obviously, Scarlet should just be very safe, and she is building a lot of units, roaches, and lings. And the adepts are setting up to move across the map, but do they really want to? I mean, there's going to be so many units. Firefly is actually already on a worker lead because Scarlet is making making so many units here to be able to deal with this. I kind of like the adepts just kind of sitting back at home, defending against these uh, lings. I mean, going across the map is not going to achieve anything. The only thing it might achieve is keeping these roaches at home, which might be nice, actually, if you keep those roaches at home. Because then the adepts don't have to, uh, you know, because then otherwise if the roaches come across the map, adepts aren't exactly the best at fighting roaches and need some time to build up that phoenix count. I don't it's weird, but I don't mind Firefly's position. He's getting ready to expand and Scarlet is still just making roaches until just now. Finally starts up seven more drones. And now the adepts are going across the map. Well, this is just in time for the Zerglings to run and deny the third base from building. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I mean... A couple of attempts peel around the side. Maybe just going to try and send a couple here, a couple there. And he's going to try and scout this third base. going to see an absolute lack of workers on it, though. And I think that already should be fairly concerned for Firefly. You look at this, you see no workers on the third. I think you should be like, okay, well, what on going on? Sees all of these roaches here as well, and that's definitely time to start getting out of there. There's no reason to commit to that shade. Yeah. These attempts just want to get back home safely, because the last thing you want is to lose them to all of those roaches. 
I like this, just shading backwards, probably commit to this one. He's uh, moving up the ramp, just looking to try and find something. A couple of adepts will remain, but uh, the Zergling is realizing that. It was, a, it was a nice idea that was just badly executed, right? Trying to get a couple of adepts on their own, but it was in vision of Scott, and Scott just chases those down, and obviously the adepts were not in any sort of safe areas. You see the Phoenix making their first appearance, though, four of them from that double Stargate follow up here and picking off four workers to begin with. Queens may well deal some damage as two more Phoenix showing up. Something close and burrow on the way. Scarlet going to go into a very harassing focus game here with these roaches now as we're going to be seeing the overlord taking a little bit of damage. Phoenix backing away up the right hand side and we are going to be seeing these adepts from Firefly. We're going to be able to pick off a bunch of those zerglings so a bunch of lings going down. Job well done there. Going to be seeing the Phoenix coming down to the bottom side of the map and looking to see what's going on. A couple more robot facilities on the way up, Forge building as well. And a nice uh, set of queens able to shoot, shoot down one of those Phoenix. And those roaches are just waiting for that tunneling and burrow and claw, tunneling, claws and burrow just to be able to get in and start dealing some damage. And there is nothing to really deal with roaches, by the way. And Firefly, obviously. If, you have, if the Phoenix back at home would be able to defend, but the Phoenix on this side is not looking so great. And almost like losing Phoenix. And he's queens so frequently while not really doing that much damage. Roach is going to burrow straight up into the main base. That sentry is not going to achieve anything. Surprise Scholar doesn't actually uh, split our Roaches up a bit more like a few into the natural. Okay, there we go. A few of them do pull away into the natural. There's going to be a lot of probes going down again. The Phoenix is going to instantly recall, but they're in range of the queens while doing it. So they take a lot of damage once again. Looking up these roaches in the natural, but already 16 probes dead. Roach is still in the main, and Roach is now running up into the third base as well. And suddenly Firefly is in a world of trouble as Scholar just has the numbers. And the Phoenix didn't really do anything. Slow Scholar down. These roaches were allowed to just look out across the map. They were allowed to just come in here. Yeah, the investment into the Phoenix just hasn't done anything. Imagine this was double robo behind the resonating glaives. Obviously a very different playstyle, but then these roaches would be in a lot more trouble. There's a lot more immortals out, and maybe an observer. But uh, yeah, against the double star here, Phoenix, this was actually a great choice. These roaches are really able to abuse the situation at the moment. There's 28 probes already down. Scarlet has money in the bank as well. Already has a Hydralis down, so switching it up into Hydralis as a follow-up. As we are going to be seeing those roaches coming over to the right-hand side. Two immortals, two adepts, and the Stalker gathering up on the third base as we do see those roaches still. Coming up to the top side, 19 more Hydras on the way. Scarlet still setting up into a bunch here at the moment. I mean, this is the thing though, Scarlet at this point just needs to sort of max out on Roach Hydra. Let's go from there as you do see a couple of Phoenix ticked off already. So we're taking a few more shots, very nearly going down, not quite though. Scarlet is able to chase those Phoenix away to the right hand side, so those are just about able to get out of here. Compared to how many Phoenix there were, there's only four left. Six of them lost, and obviously, again, they just never really did that much damage. A few drones here and there, but yeah, nothing compared to what they needed to get done, really. We are going to be seeing the Temple Archives dropping down in the main base. Hydras and Roaches on the way up here from Scarlet. More Phoenix into the center of the map. Hydras still pressing through the middle. Roaches on the top side will burrow. And again, just going to be seeing these Hydras and Roaches still pressing up to the upper left hand side of this now. Templar Archives just a few moments away from completing his observer. Set up here as well. First mortal shot. Pressing down to a rope or so. A couple of Roaches going down there. Right, here's a little finish. And here we go. Turn around to fight. This Corrosive Power's already dropping down. Four seals remain, but not that many in Scar. Should be able to just turn and fight this when these units start to run down this ramp. Just getting on top of these sentries quite nicely. That Guardian Shield though is really playing a huge role in this. Meanwhile, the roaches in the natural roaches up into the main. It's going to be a problem for Firefly, especially as he will not in the end be able to hold his third base either. A few Phoenix coming over and will be able to lift up these hydras actually, so maybe will just in the end hold this off. And again, it's all of these roaches in the main in the natural that are getting so much done. 
And obviously Skull just has the bank and the money behind us to keep on building. As Phoenix come over, I mean, there's only a couple of lifts available. So only a couple of roaches going up. And even then, there's not the DPS to get rid of these roaches. It's just slowing down the workers that they kill. Just going to see the immortal is going to come over to the left side. Going to be able to pick off that roach and again. This army of Scarlet. Just ready to go again almost. And Bane and Ness on the way up now as well. Just to be sure of things. But let me see. I think Roach Hydra will get the job done. Roach's burrow up once again. Going to start moving towards the natural paths. Nope. And unburrow. Everything gathering up together apparently. Move up that uh, ramp in towards the main base and again try and deal just a little bit more damage here. As there's all of those Balings morphing in. Two, plus two missile attack upgrade on the Evo Chamber as well. Which has popped up and started to go after some probes instantly lifted by the Phoenix. So Immortals chasing down as well. Those so just get shut down pretty easily as Balings, Roaches, and Hydras starting to press forward here. And now we're going to see them being able to come straight onto this. Immortals continue to run away. Over the top side, you see the leaders, the Hydras. Really get some surrounds, and that's going to be GG. Scarlet picks up the game number four. Keeps Newbie's hopes and dreams alive here in this best. Only needs to win one of the next two to take it home for his team. Player one. Here's the Blue Terran player on the top right hand side. Up against the Red Protoss in the bottom left, we've got ourselves Deer. He needs to win two in a row to save newbie Deer without a win on the scoreboard after last week's 0-2 defeat to Sakura. Let's hope Deer can pull it together and get something going today instead, especially when it really counts. And again, if Deer does end up 2-0 in fantasy and bring this to a 3-3 scoreline in the team match, then we will have a ace match played out. Should be a lot of fun. Should be pretty great, actually. So, looking forward to that as you see Kvanta dropping down up on the natural expansion there. Nexus across the map. The early game of this PVT looking pretty regular, looking pretty normal just for the moment. Just give me a quick moment to quickly fix the title of the stream just so people know what's going on if they just join in. Okay, so yeah, really hoping that uh, the deer can pick it up a little bit and maybe give us an ace match today. Fantasy lost 0-2 to Hero last week, but honestly, if you want to talk about his TVP, he actually looked pretty good. I think the first game wasn't great he played, but he did play uh, very well in the game after that, and he really just lost out to kind of maybe getting a bit overconfident when he was very far ahead. He walked into a few too many storms. <laughs> but in general, I think Fantasy has the potential to win a map off of deer. But it'd be really great to see Dia show up and, uh, you know, pick up a couple maps. Take us to an ace match for the first time this week. We saw one ace match last week. It'd be nice to see another again this week. Is Do you see the Reaper? Backing away. And getting on out of there. Armory on the way up from Fantasy now. It's pretty weird to see an Armory this fast in the, you know, TVP game. So what on earth is he going for? Considering he's building Cyclones... I kind of want to lean towards the fact that maybe Fantasy here is building up or thinking of building up a Magfield Accelerator upgrade. Can't think of what else you'd really want. Starport will start. So Fantasy's not going to have an insane amount of gas either. Otherwise, maybe we could have seen something ridiculous like a 4 opening. <laughs> that would have been actually crazy. Well, I guess we'll find out soon enough as the Cyclone pops out. It just feels like this is very expensive for Fantasy when, you know, at this stage of the game it's kind of hard to afford that. It's a nice find on this pile up at the top. Ooh, Drilling Pose. Ooh, that does make more sense and it is something that Fantasy has done in the past. Okay, that makes the most sense obviously because the Starport then gets a medivac. The Widow Mines are very low gas, cost, low gas cost and so you can actually afford everything now. Okay, okay. I'm, uh, I'm on board, although this is a really bad supply block for Fantasy. 46 over 46. No Supply Depot start is... Oh, this is really painful because right now he is not getting his Widow Mines out. He is not getting his Medivac out. Only just now starts up a depot, so that's a huge 30, 40 second delay. 
in terms of uh, continuing to build. And that's going to give, I mean, it stops STV production as well, so that's going to give Deer a good little something so far. Huge supply block here out of Fantasy. And uh, I'm actually worried. He was only building one supply depot, now he builds another, but obviously your supply block so long as soon as that first one finished, everything starts building. He's instantly supply blocked again. Fantasy just messing up a bit of his macro. I mean, at this point, he should have three Widow Mines and a Medivac already moving across the map. So that it hits as Dragon Claws finish, but obviously not going to be the case. It's only going to be two Widow Mines and a Medivac. So, well, now I wonder if that Drilling Claws investment isn't really going to pay off because obviously now he's going to have only two Widow Mines. They might not get very much done. And if they don't get very much done, it's a lot of gas to have spent when you're not going to use Widow Mines for a little while here. Typically, as the game progresses, you do switch back into Widow Mines after your tank play. You know, two or three tanks take a third base safely, then move back into Widow Mines is generally how it goes, but it's very hard to kind of expect that at the moment. Do you see this Medivac coming down the bottom side? Just getting ready to come through here. Nexus dropping down the third base, and you do see the command center starting up on the natural expansion. That's about to finish the fast free CC. This Medivac pauses above the pylon. I mean, is Deer really not going to see this until it starts dropping in? Oh my God, he actually isn't going to see this. Woodermine's burrow, and that is a dead set of probes. It workers killed. Surprised the Medivac isn't relocating. And getting those Woodermines out of there, it will do just at the end. Meanwhile, a couple of SCVs went down. Cyclone will lock onto this war prison to push it away. Medivac is hidden in the corner. Will still let, will stay alive and will be able to come back in with those Woodermines. And there's two more factories, so we're going to be playing mech. We have seen mech be a thing in TVP recently, and the Super Tournament it definitely had some presence. Now, it kind of comes down to the pros A figuring this out pretty quickly, and B then responding properly, because there's definitely better ways to respond and worse ways to respond. I think sometimes, uh, I mean, the problem is here, there's Colossus on the way up, right? There's no blink, there's no charge. One of the really good ways to kill mech is just to kill it as it builds, right? And go for like a massive charge box and blink stalkers try and get a lot done. Uh, you know, you can actually just, especially on Automaton, blink up into this main phase. There's a lot of abusable surface area here, run charge lots of birds at the same time. Obviously, Deer isn't really set up to do, you know, to do that, so instead Deer has to kind of maybe, I mean, I kind of feel like the best response in this sort of situation is just to throw down Stargates and start going into the air Sky Toss, because if you build up that, um, if you build up that Sky Toss, um, I don't know, if you build up that Sky Toss uh, composition, it becomes very hard, I think, for the mech player to deal with that. Fours are a bit better nowadays, but it really takes away the power of the mid-game mech army with, like, tanks and so on. It forces them into that later stage, which I think is just easier to deal with than trying to play a Mortal Archon, for example, against, like, a tank-based arm. And we are just going to be seeing the two Cyclones continuing up in the main base at the moment. Obviously very cyclone heavy for the moment here with that mag fuel accelerator about to finish. Still have this medivac down here just waiting for Dia to forget about those wooden mines for just a moment. Even if you see it in you know, you see it all the time, you gotta think at some point Dia's not always paying attention to that minimap, right? You can't always be just watching that medivac. Final pre-ignite on the way up on this uh, tech lab. More Hellions on the way out, and here we go. A bit of an army from Fantasy moving across the map. Raven in tow. Maybe trying to just go observe a hundred of these few Cyclones. He's going to find a Zealot trying to move across the map for some information as well. The Templars warping in, getting ready to go into those Archons here. This Medivac thinks about where it wants to boost to, but doesn't find an opportunity just yet. Maybe it wants to. I think the best option is obviously wait for a bit of a fight and then to try and set it up during a fight, but it's very difficult to do that. What's up, Rovio? Thank you so much for the six-month resub. Five in a row. Appreciate getting some love in the chat for that. And Aurora with the 15-month resub. Get some hype in the chat for that one as well. Thank you so much for the resubs, guys. Do appreciate it. As we do see a few zealots warping in underneath that warp prism. Widowmine gets taken down. He actually has to go off before it goes down. Cyclones will move forward and lock on, so get some damage done. Raven is looking for that anti-armor missile, I think, or interference Matrix. Hits the interference Matrix on the warp prism, and also hits an anti-armor missile on a few of the zealots at the front. Interference Matrix is great on the prism because it actually traps two Archons inside of it, and it stops Micro to lock on the, uh, to cancel the lock-ons of the Cyclones. 
But he's sick as Fantasy though is going to have to tie all the way back up into his main base. Force field is going pretty detrimental to him now as well. Catches a few of the Cyclones. And now his natural expansion into some trouble. Two of those are awesome, super low on HP, but I mean, Fantasy just can't do anything about it. And here, making his way through the entire of his natural expansion. The third base obviously in trouble too, as Fantasy just has nothing to come down the ramp. He's got 57 army supply, just doesn't feel like it. Knocks onto a sentry, is just going to get that kill. The force field is not extremely well placed. Fantasy just takes way too long to get back out of his main, and now he's lost his natural, now he's lost his third, and this has just completely fallen apart. A couple of liberators show up, but Cyclone's World Trying comes down, but he's already lost 49 SCPs. You still have units just picking apart your third base. Supply depot's going down. Command Center is having to fly way away just to be able to survive. I mean, it's actually burning down as well, so it is in some trouble. Natural's going to try and relocate, but. At the end of the day, there's just not really an army to actually fight this anyways. A couple of Widow Mines are going to connect, but I mean, you're literally defending your main base here. You see the Orcism loading up stack their models and bringing them up the ramp. Zelda's make it through. The Raven drops a desperate order to rip us. This is truly going to be over. I hope it'll about to burn down as well, so no third base anymore for Fantasy. A couple more Liberators getting up in the main base. They go down pretty quick. Plenty of Stalkers here, actually. That's the GP. Yeah, we'll pull it back. Now a 2-3 scoreline in the series. Do you just need to see what's about to happen on a new repugnancy? We start in the bottom left-hand side of the map with our Red Protoss player who has to win this map to take us to an ace match. This Red Protoss is dear. Up against the Blue Terran player in the top right-hand side, we've got ourselves Fantasy representing player one. This is it. If he wins this now, it will be over. And player one will take home their first victory of the season. <laughs> Both of these teams looking for their first victory of the season, of course. As we get this set up, we get this a rolling gateway dropping down on the bottom left-hand corner. Getting this ready to roll here. Getting looking to see what's going to be happening. Single proxy racks. The thing is, I feel like this proxy racks is almost in a position where you're going to build like a factory and a starport as well. It just doesn't feel like the proxy racks just for a reaper, where you might kind of throw it down over here or so. Mm, I guess it could just be a reaper and it could just be a very safe way of uh, placing it. Looks like the man sent oh, so this barracks coming along here at the moment, and we're still going to be seeing the uh, gateway about to finish up in the main base. On the way up, Cybercore is going to start in that main, and it's going to be a next adapt to the Cybercore, so maybe a fairly fast adept. We're about halfway done. Factory will build it home then. Just a safe place to build the barracks, I guess. Make sure it doesn't get scoured. SCV doesn't move forwards. We'll see what happens with the SCV. Obviously, there is that potential of it moving around and make building a proxy for Starport as well, for example. It could come in with the Reaper and try and build a bunker, which I'd be surprised about. It's going to be a proxied second factory. That's not one I saw coming. Maybe just double Cyclone here. Something we haven't really seen for a while, but uh, let's see what's uh, going to happen. As we are just going to see this Reaper poking in towards the main base mineral line. First Adept does pop out. Obviously, the good thing about this Reaper is it does keep the Adepts at home, so the Adepts don't go across the map. And this really limits the scouting of Dia, so Dia is very blind as to what's going on. It doesn't even have anything to confirm if there's a factory over here or not as well, so Deer playing very blind, very in the dark, but probably just expects this just to be like a something along the lines of just like a Reaper. Not much else as we are going to be seeing the factory popping up and going to be dropping a widow mine in production. A couple of marines on the way as well. What comes in at home? A cyclone. Okay, so the idea with this is going to be the widow mines are going to try and drop down at the front, but we're up kind of in this sort of area over here. And then, of course, the cyclone comes in, and you can use that motor mines just to sort of block the, uh, you know, block the units from being able to chase down those cyclones. That's pretty uh, powerful. Let's do get this ready to roll. What's up, Peter the Eater? Fifteen. Thank you so much for Twitch Prime sub, dude. Really appreciate it. That's a lovely chef, Peter. 
Thank you so much for the Twitch Prime subbing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As we do see, Reaper is just uh, hanging out. We'll see, this is all going to start coming together here very shortly. A couple of little mines being built at a time, switching that factory to the reactor. Even building the supply depot over here. And SCP is not doing anything, so he's very committed to this attack. And the idea is that with uh, SCP building the supply depot, doesn't take one of his SCPs off of minerals back at home. So it keeps as much mining going as possible. Nice first kill on the Adept here. Little mine will drop down. The Phoenix pressing through. Widowmine's actually going to bow her up. It's going to be able to go off on the Phoenix here. Gets the Phoenix pretty low. Marines are trying to target it. SCV is coming forward to repair. There's still Widowmine's available on that Cyclone. I mean, did get rid of the first Phoenix. Uh, Donkey coming down now as well. There's two Phoenix again, though. And it's a little bit dangerous. More Widowmine's about to show up. They are going to move forward. Is there enough repair on that Cyclone to keep it alive? It just stays alive. The on the ground get blown up as now the Cyclone locks onto the Phoenix, but there's a shield battery healing up here. Probes are pulled forward to fight against the Widow Mines. I mean, Widow Mines go off and more probes are going down, and I feel like Dia's in trouble. What a mess of a fight at the front. The Phoenix trying to come forward once again. SCVs are going to be able to get a bunker up to the top side. That's just nice, but it's going to be difficult to break, especially when you're relying on Phoenix. Those Widow Mines are going to pull back up. The Widow Mines are going to get burrowed, and I feel like suddenly Dia is in a world of trouble trying to deal with this. I love that Cyclone locks onto that shield battery in the back of Magfield Accelerator. It destroys that shield battery. And that was full of energy as well. And that's why I liked it. And in terms of a lock on Unburrow and a Reburrow on the Widow Mines. Just to make sure they don't get wasted on probe shots. Here you go. The Phoenix coming in. But that's going to be actually no lock-ons. Uh, sorry, no Widow Mines shots. The lock-ons were there from the Cyclones. And still just in those, uh, that bunker. Again, using the uh, probes to force the Unburrow on the Widow Mines to allow him to pick those off, but it is starting to cost him Phoenix, and the natural expansion will definitely go down here. And Francis still has a huge amount of army supply to work with as the probe goes down. Actually, he had a huge amount of uh, shield battery energy. Again, that bunker is just painful. Ooh, SCVs take a bit of splash damage. More Widow Mines coming in to reinforce. It's going to go right on top of these units. That Cyclone will go down. Phoenix are just out of range of the Widow Mines in time. I'd love to see just that one single oracle just to revelate here. Then he doesn't have to worry about waiting for the Widow Mines to unburrow. Though I guess they've been doing a pretty good job of this anyway so far. The cycle will continue to chip its way through that shield battery. Widow Mines unburrow again. Boring once more. SCP's there. They're ready to repair. I mean, that's their burrow. There is no detection, right? Robo only just now starting. It's a fantasy is going to contain the yeah, to the one base. The thing is, it is very Widow Mine heavy, so... In a weird way, it's not exactly the greatest of setups in terms of continuing on the game. Like, these Widow Mines are nice when they've got the contained, but if Dio was to get across the map or something, well, that would be deadly. Potentially, but how do you get across the map? Maybe a warp prison, that's what you got to be really careful of, as the Widow Mines pushing themselves forwards here. This is coming through. That single Cyclone really needs a repair. Super low HP at the front. I mean, this is nice. Forcing himself into the main base, it gives Fantasy some options here. The Widow Mines that are in Burrow do come and get killed, lifted by those Phoenix. Cyclone lock-on was good, but the Cyclone's taking a lot of damage as well. One of them dies, and the other again in desperate need of repair. Those Phoenix out of energy. There isn't actually any more Phoenix building here. The Phoenix is trying friendly fire. I mean, that's nice as well, but now there's only Sorkers, and these Widow Mines are going to continue creeping their way forwards. There's the Observer, though. The Cyclone's lock onto the Robo facility, and they want to stop an Immortal from coming up. I mean, obviously, the uh, Observer is a huge part of this to scan. Is nice, but you need the Cyclones to lock onto that Observer still. Now that the Robo facility is dead, if you can get rid of the Observer, in a very good position. The Observer sieged up. Being able to obviously see a little bit further, and those Widow Mines getting cleaned out by the minute. In fact, all these Widow Mines, I think, are going to die. And there's one, two, and the last one, not quite, because the Cyclones will turn the Stalkers away. It's going to be seeing the couple extra Widow Mines coming up. Single Marine in that bunker, and we are just going to be seeing this Cyclone of Fantasy coming over to the left-hand side. Probe of Dia comes down to the low ground, going to drop down a pylon as well. Just going to be seeing a couple extra wooden mines continue to pop out. Cyclone about to complete in a few moments as well, and still just getting those Cyclones set up to potentially deal with these Stalkers and Zealots. Cancel on the pylon once again, and... Well, this is not quite over. Fantasy losing all those Widow Mines, that's the problem, right? I mean, the Widow Mines is something he's just so reliant on. Trying to rebuild those Widow Mines now is kind of tough as well, because there's another Robo on the way up, so there will be, you know, observers in play again here shortly. 
fact that there is already an observer in play, right? Because he never cleaned out that one observer. Four cyclones are dangerous. He loses high ground vision. It's a shame because actually had some potential to kill there, I think. Another cyclone, two more widow mines. Still no expansion back at home for fantasy. And while this was going very well for him, Dia has started to turn this around. Let's see if he's continuing to try and chase these cyclones, repair them up when possible. I feel like there's just so many stalkers now that if the Widow Mines try and move forward, they just get one shot. And that Observer, absolute MVP, allowing all those Widow Mines to finally be cleaned up. If only that scan had come down, Fantasy was able to pick off that Observer. This game could look so very different. And he's going to see stalkers here. Oh, actually, there's still a couple of stalkers lost to those Widow Mines as Cyclones lock on to the prison, but one of the Cyclones going down. Stalkers again. Ooh, going to get connected onto by the Widow Mine. Oh, and the one person goes down as well. Of course, you see there is no blink or anything here, but this is nice because now this factory is in some trouble. The Cyclones are going to die for a counterattack. Well, actually, don't mind that either. Although some Stalkers will already warp in. I guess there will be a recall here eventually to kind of save this. Well, these Stalkers go going to stick around until they get rid of this factory. Probes and Stalkers being pulled now. I mean, Deer is pretty much mine out of the main. Fantasy is getting an expansion up. But can Fantasy defend an expansion is the problem. There's the Observer. Probes in the center already getting picked off. I mean, they're doing their job, though, tanking. There's a Robo facility, but there is no Observer. It is just being built now. So that was a nice scan. Oh, that's going to be maybe a dead uh, stalker if it wasn't careful. That wouldn't mind just staying put. Well, the advantage for Fantasy at the moment is that he will have a command center back at home. Building up a siege tank, something a little bit more stable and solid to be able to defend with here. Something that can really kind of hold the ground, which is really necessary at the moment. These SCVs need to get repair, and they're just AFK at the moment on the low ground. There we go, getting to work. Boy, oh boy, what a game this has turned out to be between Fantasy and Tier. A real epic it's turned into. I'm just going to see another tank down to the low ground. She's going to pull back up to the high ground. I kind of like that. It covers the main base as well, which could be a real threat. You know there's a robo up. You know there's a potential of a warp prism. So having the tank to cover the high ground as well is nice, although it is a bit more exposed where it is, because obviously it's kind of, it, it's fairly safe. You have to be kind of like right here, which is in range of the bunker to hit it, right? It's not like other maps where if you put it here, it's actually very exposed with the layout of the base. This little area here actually helps a lot with that, this little chasm. Keeps that tank a little bit safer as deer. It's essentially one base all in, of course. Still hasn't expanded. Cyclones are looking for the opportunity to see what's going on. Observer sees what he's going to have to push into. That siege tank is already going to unsiege and pull back just that little bit. I like it. Warpers in here is very powerful as it is going to be able to get rid of some of these lock-on factory. Moves out the way so the tank can actually get out and siege up in a safer position. And I think that's the hold that Fantasy needs as the Warpers in locks on. Player 1 will take home their first series win of the season. And it is going to be Newbie going 0-2 so far this season. That's not what we expected from a team like Newbie. They